Hello, and thank you for joining the webinar today. We're going to give folks another moment to log in. We'll be starting soon. Okay, let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to the 2022-2023 Better Buildings webinar series, dedicated to bringing you the latest actionable insights from leading industry experts. This annual series is a chance to explore the topics, technologies, and trends that affect your organization, as well as efforts to accelerate decarbonization and energy efficiency adoption. Today's webinar, is titled Strategies for Achieving Zero Energy in Multifamily Buildings. Before we dive in, there are a few housekeeping points I would like to cover. Please note today's webinar will be recorded and archived on the Better Building Solutions Center. We will follow up when today's recordings and slides are made available. Next, attendees are in listen-only mode, meaning your microphones are muted. If you experience any audio or visual issues throughout the webinar, please send a message in the Q&A box located on the bottom of your Zoom pen. My name is Josh Geyer. I'm the multifamily sector lead for the Better Buildings Initiative, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is focused on the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers' recent, recently published Advanced Energy Design Guide for Multifamily Buildings. The guide was developed with support from the Department of Energy to help multifamily building owners and operators, design professionals, and developers create zero energy buildings. Today, the creators of the guide will provide a walkthrough and highlight some of the almost 200 strategies for achieving zero energy building. We'll also hear from an organization called SPP that funded and built a net zero mixed income 50 unit complex in New Orleans. Their work was featured as a case study in the guide and they will bring a practitioner's point of view on zero energy multifamily buildings. Okay, so Today's webinar was organized by the Better Buildings Multifamily Sector, which is a partnership between the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and U.S. Department of Energy. Multifamily sector features two goal-based challenges for multifamily organizations who want to lead their peers in advancing climate action through better buildings. The Better Buildings Challenge asks partners to commit to improve the energy efficiency of their portfolios by 20% over 10 years. The Better Climate Challenge, which HUD and DOE announced in November 2021, calls on leading multifamily organizations to commit to the ambitious goal of reducing their portfolio-wide greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% within 10 years. Together with the Department of Energy and the DOE National Labs, we provide technical assistance to help partners tackle barriers, facilitate peer-to-peer -peer exchange, and provide a national platform that demonstrates partners' leadership in addressing climate change. If your multifamily organization is interested in joining us in this path-breaking effort, please contact me via email. Today, we will be using an interactive platform for Q&A polling. Please go to www.slido.com on your mobile device or by opening a new window in your internet browser. Today's event code is hashtag DOE. If you would like to ask our panelists questions, please submit them anytime throughout the presentation. We will be answering your questions near the end of the webinar. You can select the thumbs up icon for questions you like, which will result in the most popular questions moving to the top of the queue. We have a great lineup of presenters today. We'll be hearing from Paul Torsolini from National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Stet Sanborn from Smith Group, and Keith McCullough from SPP. To start us off, I'm pleased to introduce two key contributors of the Advanced Energy Design Guide for Multifamily Buildings, Paul Torsolini and Stet Sanborn. 
Alto Salini is a principal engineer for commercial buildings research at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. He chaired the technical committees that produced the Zero Energy Advanced Energy Design Guides. Stat, Stat Stanborn serves as the engineering discipline leader in Smith Group's San Francisco office. He serves on ASHRAE's decarbonization task force and was a co-author of ASHRAE's Advanced Energy Design Guide for Zero Energy and Multifamily Buildings. Welcome, Paul and Stat. Thanks, Josh. Uh, let's move to the next slide. So uh, Stet and I are going to talk about the uh, Advanced Energy Design Guide for Zero Energy. It's actually the third in a series um, that ASHRAE has put out in conjunction with AIA, U.S. Green Building Council, IES, with funding from the U.S. Department of Energy. If I didn't mention AIA in there, AIA was also a partner there. So it's a multi-organizational effort. Um, ASHRAE is the publisher of the guide. And uh, before I forget, they are available as a free download off of ASHRAE's website, or you can get a hardbound version uh, from the ASHRAE bookstore, as well as from the other organizations. Um, it is the third in the series. As I mentioned, we previously had done one on office buildings, as well as K-12 school buildings. So if you're interested in those sectors, I encourage you to look at the guidance specific to those buildings as well. Um, the design guidance is by building type and climate zone. It's really to help practitioners and owners uh, achieve very aggressive levels of energy savings and then meet the remaining load with renewable resources. Um, I like to think of it as three pieces. First of all, we assembled a committee of experts to uh, put these guides together. Um, so Stet uh, was uh, one of those experts that was on the team uh, doing this. Um, so that is one piece that we have. We also uh, do energy modeling uh, that the National Renewable Energy Lab does um, to help set the goals and help to inform the decisions and the ideas that the committee comes up with. And finally, we have case studies um, that represent um, similar buildings. Now, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg here, right? You can't design the guide and then get case studies to put into the guide. So they represent kind of state-of-the-art case studies that are out there that show people that a lot of these strategies are feasible and can be done. And so it's really three pieces coming together uh, to form these guides. It really is looking for a substantial reduction in energy going way beyond what the energy uh, code does. Next slide. So I mentioned it is a joint effort of AIA, ASHRAE, U.S. Green Building Council, and IES. Um, there are several uh, pieces of this, um, talking about definitions and process and what is this. Um, this guide, new to the other guides, uh, starts a discussion around uh, reducing uh, carbon footprint as well and realizing that the carbon, the operational carbon footprint is heavily tied to the energy consumption of the building. Um, the solutions we're going to talk about today, and we're just going to kind of give you a flavor for some of those solutions. It's a mix of prescriptive and performance-based approaches that we're using. Um, and really looking at it from a whole building while then digging into the different parts of it. Um, we also provide a lot of additional considerations. Some of these technologies um, may be new. Uh, we did try to pick strategies of things that are well-established out there. Um, not something that you know, you're not gonna see on the shelf for a couple of years but something that is very practical that you can go and do today. Um, I'm gonna to talk a little bit in a couple of minutes about recommended energy targets, um, but it does put targets in there. So if you wanna to go to a design team and say, design me a multifamily building that, that hits these energy targets, it gives you some um, basis for establishing what that target is as what we would call performance-based procurement. Um, and then examples of buildings with their performance data. And as I mentioned, you can get this off of ASHRAE's website as a free download as a PDF version, as well as all of the other design guides. I guess I should mention that this is a third series. We had previously done a series on 50% and many years ago, we had a 30% series. So this just keeps kind of ratcheting up the bar um, with very uh, achievable results uh, that you can have in your buildings. Uh, next slide. So uh, the guides are divided into five chapters. We start with an introduction, what some of the benefits are. We move to principles to make it successful, how to form teams, how to get decision makers and champions on board. 
uh, going into a little bit of the process in terms of setting goals as well as targets that you can use. Um, since we used analysis and energy modeling heavily in the guide to help inform the decisions and help the committee, we talk about how to leverage that analysis and how to use that to your benefit. And really the bulk of the guide, well over half of the guide is chapter five, these um, how-to strategies, which become kind of a menu of ideas or an idea book of things you can incorporate into your building. Not all of them will be applicable for every building. Uh, next slide. So uh, starting with what the targets are, these were based on our modeled results and informed by the committee and the decisions that are made. Uh, there is a little bit of variation between climate zones, uh, but you can see a couple of things here which we're gonna talk about. One is, is that it's classified as internal equipment, but it's better known as kind of plug and process loads, things that get plugged in, things that are used in the building that are not heating, cooling, and lighting are definitely a significant part of this sector. Um, another part that is significant that we're going to talk about later is domestic hot water. And interestingly, that varies quite a bit depending on occupant and occupant behavior and some of the demographics of those occupants. Um, and um, lighting is another fairly significant chunk um, of the mix at the end of the day with heating and cooling making up the remainder of it. One of the things to note on these EUIs that except in the extremely hot climates and the extremely cold climates, which would be climate eight is extremely cold, um, the numbers are in the low 20,000 20, BTUs per square foot as a site energy use. So even just as a, a kind of a ballpark number, trying to keep your numbers under 25,000 BTUs per square foot, in most places in the country is a good good place to start in thinking about creating highly efficient uh, multifamily buildings. Uh, next slide. Um, we did some sensitivity analysis around this. In general, this guide is designed for multifamily that is over four stories. Um, and so you can roughly say maybe four to 20 stories is the sweet spot for a lot of the guide, uh, kind of that mid range. What we learned is, is that you can move to more stories and not have a serious change in what that EUI is. There are certainly ideas that you can apply for smaller buildings, but in general, this represents more of a commercial building with vertical transportation, perhaps large amounts of parking, uh, and not a, say, set of row homes or patio homes. Um, although you can definitely learn strategies out of this that apply, but all the modeling and things were done on this kind of mid to high rise uh, building type. Uh, next slide. And so uh, just to kind of preface the how to tips again, there's almost 200 tips with instructions, recommendations and cautions, right? What things should you watch out for? We also, new to this guide, started looking at non-energy attributes of different energy efficiency measures. And that could be, and we actually, in front of each of the tips, we use little icons to describe what those were. So things like you know, peak demand reduction or grid alignment, uh, energy resilience, which has become uh, you know, uh, a very common topic to discuss. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about that in the case study at the end of this. Capital cost savings, strategies that actually save money up front as well as saving energy, and applicability to retrofits. Uh, there are a lot of strategies in the book, even though um, you can think of it as new construction, but we're finding it's a lot of applications for retrofit in these. The categories of these tips are buildings and site planning, and then moving into envelope, lighting, and somewhat in order of how we like people to think about it, plug loads and power distribution, domestic hot water, and then finally, kind of what kind of HVAC works the best in these buildings with these low loads. And then when all of that is done, how do we make up the remaining loads with renewable energy sources? Next slide. So, you know, many older buildings and, you know, thinking about, um, you know, even the retrofits, considered a lot of the elements that we talk about in site planning, such as orientation for natural ventilation and natural light. I really like thinking about buildings that were built before 1940, because in a lot of cases, they needed to incorporate this. And there is a large fraction of the multifamily space that, that fits into that category, the ability to shade windows. 
But then there are new strategies that are coming up, like how to think about you know, keeping the roof area clean for photovoltaics, or like in this example photo, using it as an amenity to the building uh, for a patio. Um, and even things like how do you plan the site? Because as we move to heat pumps, they need a lot of outside air in order to either take in heat or reject heat. Next slide. Um, in the guide, there are lots of details uh, for architectural and in particular looking at how to deal with uh, vapor movement, water movement, and getting a good thermal barrier at the same time. And so there's um, a lot of these details that were drawn by one of the committee's architects um, to really think about how to properly insulate a building and not have things like parapets be huge fins that extend out of the building or balconies that are huge fins are two that, that, that come to mind right away. We also have information on how to pressure test these buildings and guidance around what kinds of numbers to expect. If you really want to ensure that the envelope of the building is working properly and that really helps the mechanical engineers think about sizing HVAC equipment, make a commitment to pressure test buildings, uh, looking for those leaks and sealing up those leaks. Next slide. Um, we move into lighting as one of the categories um, and showing how lightings can be laid out. There's a lot of the building that is common area. And so we provide things like conference rooms, office areas, uh, hallways and, and lighting schemes for that, as well as recommendations for in-unit lighting. Um, and even suggestions like you know, providing tenants LED light bulbs that they can use in their lamps um, to help you know, promote the energy efficiency of, of the total space. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stet to talk about HVAC. Thanks, Paul. Um, so one of the things that we, um, as Paul talked about, was in our modeling, we were looking at sort of the breakdown of end uses. Um, and one of the things that sort of differentiates multifamily as a sector from a lot of other uh, building types, especially commercial buildings, is the big draw on domestic hot water systems. So the really independent of climate zone, when we started looking at uh, where that breakdown was on energy use, we really see that heating, space heating and cooling and domestic hot water in almost every climate zone really account for about half the energy use of the building, even for these really aggressive um, high efficiency buildings. On the next slide, um, I'll dive in a little bit to probably one of the meteor sections um, in, in the guide. Um, so next slide. Um, one of the areas that really is differentiated um, in multifamily buildings relative to commercial buildings is domestic hot water. Um, this is something that over the last couple of years, is, uh, as buildings have attempted to decarbonize, uh, get higher efficiency and move to all electric systems, the domestic hot water system has been um, sort of one of the toughest areas to transition. And so the guide really takes a deep dive into domestic hot water systems, uh, probably one of the deepest dives that um, a lot of guides have gone into to date. Uh, we don't just stop at heat pumps. Um, heat pumps are heavily featured uh, in the guide for domestic hot water, but really we dive into almost all the flavors of heat pumps that you might encounter in the multifamily uh, world, uh, depending on the scale of your building type. The graph on the left is uh, one that you can see as an example of sort of going into detail on a whole host of flavors of heat pump systems. Um, you know, the guide talks about everything from in-unit heat pump water heaters that you might see on smaller scale buildings, um, even some of the garden walk-up style uh, multifamily buildings, um, all the way to what we would consider some of the most advanced air source heat pumps uh, in the marketplace. In addition, uh, the more complex systems that we've seen that actually can return even higher efficiency uh, we also present information on wastewater heat recovery. One of the best opportunities, especially in cold climates for multifamily buildings is to pair a heat pump um, as a heat recovery device, effectively stealing heat back out of the wastewater that's leaving the building and use that heat to heat the domestic hot water that then is serving uh, going back into that building. The guide also goes into pretty deep detail in some of the nuances where heat pump water heating is differentiated from um, older technologies like boilers. Uh, so heat pumps, air source heat pumps, water source heat pumps can really be broken down into a lot of categories. Um, and 
the main distinguishing category that we see is between um, multi-pass and single-pass heat pumps. And the way that you design them is different uh, so that you make sure that you're guaranteeing those high efficiency numbers and the high capacity numbers. So in addition to the energy modeling and analysis, as you can see on the right, we also provide sort of the piping diagrams and recommended installation strategies for those different systems to make sure you're getting all the value out of that investment. Next slide. You can see here some of the examples um, of system types that uh, are, are shown in the guide. Um, and again, these vary really uh, quite a bit depending on the scale of your, uh, of your building. Uh, so we definitely talk about large central systems, uh, air source heat pumps combined with large storage volumes um, to provide domestic hot water for larger buildings. Uh, these can be your high-rise buildings. Uh, you may see a number of installations of these across the uh, building if it's an ex uh, especially tall building. Uh, you might see different pressure zones. Um, but we do talk about the marriage of heat pumps plus storage. Again, because this guide is multifamily focused, um, this is an area uh, that we're also trying to drive both the high efficiency in multifamily as well as cost effectiveness because one of the target audiences for this guide is also our affordable housing partners. When you pair heat pumps with storage, that's where we see a really sweet spot from an economic standpoint to reduce the first costs on the system. In addition to large central systems, we also acknowledge that buildings are going to, you know, some buildings may see individual heat pumps per unit um, or what we call semi distributed heat pumps, where a couple units might be ganged together on a single heat pump. Those can typically be seen in the flavor of, of split heat pumps, so you can see an example of in the middle, or you might have an outdoor condensing unit and then interior storage component. At the far end of distributed systems, we also see examples uh, like the one on the right. Uh, these are more of a sort of a commodity heat pump that you can buy at your local home improvement store, uh, where the heat pump is actually included right on top of the storage tank. Uh, we're seeing more um, projects actually investigate these in lieu of central systems uh, because they allow you to get rid of the complexities of a distribution system through the building, um, allowing you to just bring cold water and electricity to the unit um, and then have a set effectively free cooling coming off of the heat pump within the unit itself. These are particularly effective um, for hot and humid climates because they give you that benefit of essentially giving you free air conditioning uh, within the unit if appropriately installed. One of the nice things, um, and again, this is, you know, DOE has been especially um, supportive of this for those distributed heat pump water heaters on the right. There's a whole class of them that are just coming on the market right now, which are what we call shared circuit or 120 volt uh, heat pump water heaters. These allow them to be actually plugged in like any other appliance and don't necessarily require a dedicated circuit. So again, the guide sort of goes into detail about um, which of these systems you might pick in any installation and what benefit they might provide for your building. Next slide. The other element of that sort of half of the energy pie that we focus on um, is on space heating and cooling. And again, unlike the commercial sector, the heating and cooling systems that we see in multifamily um, sector vary widely. Uh, everything from split heat pumps, uh, you know, mini split sort of unit by unit uh, strategies, all the way to central VRF systems, uh, very variable refrigerant flow, um, all the way to hydronic systems. There's a whole, depending on where you are in the country, what scale your building's at, um, what kind of location you're in, how tight your site is, there's a whole host of different MEP systems uh, that might be appropriate. So the guide goes into detail explaining a whole family of solutions and then provides guidance for each climate zone on which ones will deliver that highest efficiency value when you're trying to drive down uh, the EUI. Uh, we don't limit ourselves to air source heat pumps or just VRF systems or mini splits. We also go into detail um, on systems that in include ground coupled systems, uh, so geothermal systems. As when we start looking at, again, some of those more challenging climates where um, air source heat pump uh, performance starts to drop off a little bit, uh, the water source heat pumps combined with a ground source heat pump can actually, or a ground source um, exchange can actually provide exceptional efficiency uh, throughout the year. Again, focused on not just performance, but also delivering uh, sort of that best uh, economic impact uh, for a project. Next slide. I'm gonna hand it back um, a little bit to Paul right now to talk a little bit about that transition to uh, on the plug load side. Sure, so as I mentioned earlier, plug loads are um, a significant part of this. And, you know, often I think we think is, you know, engineers, architects, building owners, that there's not much we can do about it. But I think there's definitely things that we can do to encourage it. And a certain fraction of them are kind of hardwired and part of the building. 
So go to the next slide. Um, I already talked about kind of lighting, how that fits into it, but even things like, you know, what kind of uh, cooking are you providing? You know, um, are you providing, say, induction cook units or conventional electric units? You know, how are those appliances selected for that project? You can even look at things like uh, giving people, you know, smart power strips, right? Or incorporating those directly into the outlets. Um, to help tenants uh, with their energy savings um, as, as they go along. Now, with that also needs to come a fairly large education campaign. Um, and it could just be an education campaign on how people bring things into the building and what kinds of things they use. So next slide. Um, one of the ones that, that does come up is in-unit uh, washers and dryers. And sometimes they're provided, sometimes they're not. Um, but interestingly, moving towards some of the heat pump units, uh, one of the advantage of a heat pump dryer is, is that you also don't need exhaust venting that goes with it and all the complications that, and costs that goes with exhaust venting, including what do you do with the lint and how does lint build up in all of these exhaust ducts and maintaining all of that. Um, certainly available today on a residential scale for in-unit. Um, I know that when we wrote the guide, we were challenged to find this kind of for an, a commercial laundry mat size. And so if anybody knows of products that are out there, certainly let us know about that, but th because that is one of the questions that comes up back to us. And encourage not only um, on the building owner side, but shop with the energy guide label in mind, right? And select, you know, um, refrigerators based on low annual performance. One way to do that is look for the Energy Star logo on um, appliances that are applicable, such as refrigerators. And that can also make a huge difference, uh, especially if you're outfitting an entire building uh, with the refrigeration for that. So uh, next slide. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to Steph. Thanks, Paul. Um, one of the things that we see in multifamily buildings um, that's always a challenge uh, when we're talking to uh, developers uh, or architects that are working on new construction especially um, is when they're looking at high efficiency buildings and strategies to electrify or decarbonize those buildings, there's always some holdout things and they typically fall into the amenities package. Um, you know, developers, especially in the market uh, rate sector, uh, talk to us a lot about how it's an amenities arms race uh, for different developers of trying to compete for tenants um, in, in urban centers. And there's always a few technology holdouts. There's discussions of, well, what about my rooftop barbecue? What about my fire pits, decorative fireplaces, um, even outdoor uh, thermal comfort issues around uh, space heating? Um, and so that's all, oftentimes that's the, the, the last pieces once we've dealt with domestic hot water, once we've dealt with space heating and cooling, and as, as Paul mentioned, once we've uh, dealt with uh, laundry, the amenities are often that holdout part of keeping natural gas on uh, a project. And it's that last little bit of the carbon footprint that a lot of our developers are trying to get rid of. So even um, as I talked about, you know, mechanical system changing rapidly over time, uh, we're also seeing rapid changes in the amenity world as well. Um, and so we've included just a couple of examples here um, where that we're using on projects uh, where we're able to switch out natural gas uh, systems uh, for uh, say electric grills uh, that even still have little uh, containers that you can put your wood chips in that give you that smoked flavor, um, but without um, needing to pipe natural gas all the way to the roof of your building or out to your patios or amenity spaces. Fireplaces have often also been that holdout. Um, rarely are these serving a, um, a, an actual thermal value. They're usually a decorative feature uh, indoors and outdoors. Um, there's actually new products that have come onto the market within the last um, three years that are also an all electric LED and fog based uh, fireplace system. So the example on the lower left is one of those. Um, so it actually uh, makes essentially a fog mist um, and then uses LED patterned light and sound uh, to mimic a fireplace. And I've seen these actually in person, you know, usually I'm, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer and architect, but I'm also usually pretty skeptical of anything that's trying to mimic anything else. Um, but I can testify um, that these are actually 
incredibly lifelike um, and and give you that sensation of comfort and warmth um, and sort of uh, familiarity that you're looking for, but without needing to um, duct flue gases, without needing to pipe natural gas through the building. Um, and both of these technologies, if we think about it from a safety standpoint, the um, the electric grills that you can put that building owners can put on a timer timer control lockout periods as well as the fire decorative fireplaces. Both of these technologies offer a reduced risk on the project as well, um, especially within those amenity spaces. So they actually can give owners a little bit more control um, over hours of operation um, and how um, spaces might be used. Next slide. So one of the big things, once we've dealt with mechanical systems, domestic hot water systems, plug loads, especially, you know, we're, we've taken a look at that entire piece of the pie. Um, projects right now across the country um, are investing heavily uh, in solar panels, um, trying to drive down the operational um, energy costs of their project, as well as provide sort of a hedge against inflationary pressures. So locking into a cost for uh, power for the building um, is a really smart strategy for building owners. One of the challenges, though, in multifamily buildings, that there's often sort of the split incentive of, you know, as an owner developer, um, if you're buying the PV system and installing on the building, um, you're and you're offsetting tenant use, you know, you're providing a benefit to them, and they're not necessarily paying for it. And so how does the owner recoup that the cost of that investment? The guide actually goes into pretty in, uh, in depth detail on how that can start to work out um, in in different forms, um, including virtual net metering, uh, where um, the entire where occupants of the building tenants can actually sort of set up and sign in to a virtual net metering scenario. Um, so again, providing some uh, a benefit back to the owner. Um, and, and not requiring individual PV arrays for every single uh, unit where the balance of system costs would be sort of untenable uh, for a lot of those uh, installations. Something that we're seeing, you know, multifamily is a, is a pretty broad sector, at, you know, covering everything from rental um, uh, units to own condos all the way to senior living uh, and care facilities. It's a very complex uh, model, but across the board, there's definitely renewed or heightened interest in resiliency as well. Um, and so we talk about how these on-site PV systems can be coupled uh, with battery backup, which can provide ongoing support for a, pro uh, for a project in the event of storms or where I'm at, wildfires that have uh, caused preemptive power shutoffs. Uh, batteries plus PVs on a sort of a microgrid situation can really provide the best of that resilience as well as a cost-effective solution. Um, I think we're often asked about, you know, backup systems, especially generators for elevator controls, et cetera. Um, and when we look at generators um, as a backup source, and, and this is sort of played out in the financial modeling, when we look at generators, um, they're often carrying sort of that sunk cost, they're an investment, but they're not often able to be used effectively or cost effectively uh, for demand charge manipulation, as an example. Whereas batteries plus PVs actually can provide you ongoing financial support every hour of the day um, and provide you with that backup uh, power uh, resiliency requirement. So it's a really uh, sort of two two birds with one stone situation. Um, so the guide definitely goes into quite a bit of detail about how you can incorporate PVs and batteries into your project um, in a really cost effective way. Next slide. Um, the other element uh, that we wanted to highlight is that um, often comes with a challenge, um, and that's incorporating EV charging into multifamily buildings. A lot of multifamily buildings include on-site parking, uh, whether it's in the form of a parking garage uh, below the podium, below grade, or adjacent to the building. Um, and oftentimes, multifamily tenants are the ones who are left out of sort of the electric vehicle um, opportunities because of a lack of uh, infrastructure for charging. So we go into detail um, sort of as a, as a side, a pretty uh, deep dive into the different types of charging uh, that are provided or can be provided to a project, every, everything from standard 120 volt level one charging um, up to DC fast charging. And we're seeing the deployments of EV charging um, kind of uh, skyrocket really in multifamily buildings. And one of the things that becomes a very strong cost constraint on projects is the ability to manage that load. And so we actually do go into detail about load management systems for EV charging that actually can help bring down the cost of the electrical infrastructure uh, for those for that installation. Um, and in, so as more vehicles plug in, 
uh, the low distributor to cross of them rather than just additive so that we end up with transformer sizing that's more appropriate for the scale of the building while also providing sort of that backup uh, capacity to a building or, or backup capacity um, for the EV charging across the network. Next. And now I'm going to hand it over to Keith to talk about an actual demonstration project um, deploying some of these strategies. Great. Thank you, Stet. Um, it's nice. Uh, it's exciting to be here. My name is Keith McCullough, and I'm the CFO of SBP. Um, we are excited to, um, next slide, um, we're excited to be here to talk about the St. Peter apartment complex that's based here in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's a two and a half year old 50 unit building. Um, but more importantly, um, and much to what Paul and Stet were just talking about, we think it's symbolic of, of really how multifamily housing could and should be constructed. We'll get into the details, but before we do, uh, let me start with who SBP is as an organization. Uh, next slide. SBP was founded in the aftermath of Katrina nearly 17 years ago. Um, it was founded in the parish or county, as some of you know, uh, of St. Bernard Parish, which is which is where our name St. Bernard Project or SBP is derived from. Our, our, our founders, Liz McCarthy and Zach Rosenberg, were previously an elementary school teacher and a criminal defense attorney from D.C., and they simply wanted to support and the recovery and rebuilding of New Orleans. Uh, what they soon discovered was too many stories of lost hope and a broken disaster recovery system. They were committed to realizing change in this space, and so they founded SBP. We are a social impact organization that focuses on disaster recovery and resilience in at-risk communities. Our, our mission is to shrink the time between disaster and recovery, and we operate today in eight, uh, eight sites, operating sites uh, domestically, and two additional sites internationally. Uh, next slide. Uh, we do this in three main ways. Uh, we prepare homeowners for the when, not the if. Uh, we do this through direct trainings and providing online resources. Uh, we shape policies uh, by, by working directly with uh, kind of at-risk communities and advising those communities on how to best spend government dollars that have been allocated to them through disaster recovery allocations. And then the third, which is relevant to how we got to or how we're going to talk about and frame St. Peter is we build, we build, we repair, we rebuild directly in the aftermath of events uh, for at risk survivors. Um, and we've done about 3000 homes to date since our inception. Next slide. So uh, as many of you guys can understand, the disaster recovery, there's a continuum of disaster recovery. Um, there is the initial impact, there's the immediate response, mucking, gutting, there's the repairs, there's the long-term rebuilding, and then there's this element of community development. Uh, we believe that SBP's kind of afford, what I'll call our affordable housing uh, segment, or we call it our op housing segment, fits within that those latter two buckets. Um, St. Peter really is is uh, was our first project into this space, and it really was designed in such a way to fortify people against future disasters. And we'd focus really in you know those residents or, or those community members that are most at risk or a low to moderate residents. You can see in the bottom there the the income mix. Primarily, it's it's restricted to to those low income folks, but I will say. Most of those market rate units are also now serving Section 8 tenant voucher or Section 8 vouchers, which are, are uh, traditionally low income as well. So next slide. Mm -hmm. What we hope to achieve here was really was simply, a, you know, basically a designation that hadn't been achieved here in Louisiana on any multi, uh, multifamily building, which was that net zero status. And we or designation rather. And we did that through really a combination of three three kind of focus areas, obviously making sure that there was a plethora of solar panels or PVs to generate the power. Then we would strategically have obviously enough batteries to support, you know, as a reserve to support the, uh, you know, the events where we do go off grid, whether that's a, you know, prolonged, you know, uh, prolonged period um, through, through a night or through kind of inclement weather. And then the third was, as you're hearing again from from Paul and Stad, is is how do we how do we think about the demand of the building? These traditionally haven't really been that really hasn't been a focus of affordable housing developers or multifamily projects historically. How do we kind of think through that? And we'll talk about 
kind of the the factors of what that looked like. But on to the next slide. So we, in partnership with uh, SQ Dumez uh, and Ripple, along with Broadmoor, uh, we considered a, a number of elements. Uh, there's there's um, some resiliency factors that aren't even mentioned here. Uh, detention tank, uh, bioswells, permeable surfaces, all of those were considered. But as it specifically relates to energy and carbon, kind of we looked at the following items. So made sure that we were uh, designing the building to be timber rather than metal for to reduce carbon footprint. As you know, uh, having you know appropriate number of PVs, you could see in the bottom uh, left there, the, the PVs that litter kind of the roof. Um, obviously that strengthens the, the general, uh, the, the roof um, uh, exterior. Uh, we also strategically placed, you know, thought about, well, where do we put these batteries? Um, and we designed the batteries in such a way that um, we looked at Katrina, which was the worst flood event in the history of New Orleans. Uh, that that area, this area, got about two and a half feet of water. We strategically placed this battery storage in that, and you can see it in that DynaPower image, uh, about three feet above above grade to ensure that if there was another event of similar status that we would be protected as best we could. Um, and so, and then lastly, and, and again, what, you're, what you've heard kind of throughout is there had to be significant focus on kind of the demand. And so what we found, um, interestingly, was that the bulk of, you know, we looked at the envelope, we looked at the HVAC, but really where we found the best bang for our buck here was uh, with the Energy Star upgrades. Um, uh, so just at a high level, you know, we'll talk here shortly about cost, but it was about a third for PVs, a third for battery, a third for kind of demand, and, and primarily that was Energy Star upgrades. The other component here, and that was also previously mentioned, was the resident kind of uh, education. So we didn't want to oversize this building. We wanted to make sure that we were sizing it the appropriate way, that it was enough to power the building as it should be uh, as it should be, you know, called for. And so when our residents come into the building, there's an important element of education that goes along with this um, and training. And we'll talk more about what that looks like. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so as you can see from the uses there in the, on the left and, um, and, and the sources on the right, the vast majority of this, uh, of the project, the solar PV and battery, about 60% or 66% of it was about $700,000. That was primarily that was primarily paid for through, for us, the low-income housing tax credits that the project qualified for and the federal uh, solar tax credit. However, we did benefit from a, a grant with Entergy. And again, I would encourage, you know, you all as developers to consider, you know, applying for grants that uh, that have a focus for us with Entergy. They were a great partner and we're simply sharing data with them and, and telling them about the learnings that we have on an ongoing basis. Uh, additionally, and what's not highlighted here, and it's no, it's um, baked into that other hard cost are the upgrades associated with um, the demand use uh, or reducing the demand. That was again, about another 300,000. So we were between one and 1.1 million or about 10% of the total project cost to achieve, again, what we believe is uh, is kind of that net zero des designation and, and that kind of building for the future. Um, what I would say here, just to, anecdotally, is that while we are an affordable housing developer, um, and, and we certainly recognize that not all developers can take advantage of the LIHTC, they certainly can take full advantage of the solar tax credits, um, but there are other ways to think about it. And again, I think Stet mentioned this, you could very well consider the savings that you're realizing um, in utilities and pass that and, and, and take full advantage of that by grossing up the rent. Uh, again, assuming utilities are baked into the rent and then underwriting kind of the project that may be a higher debt service. Um, obviously, there's some there's certain some risk to that, but it really should cover the vast majority of the cost. The other aspect, and, and we'll go to the next slide here that's important is what we're seeing today is, is very relevant, but there is there is an upside in turnover rate. Um, so, we, you know, each of our units are sub-metered. We, again, knowing that the vast majority of our residents struggle to kind of meet their, you know, monthly obligations, we actually pass the solar tax credits, or sorry, the solar um, credits that are that are generated directly to the, the tenants. 
uh, and really subsidize effectively their utility bills. Um, but but I, I I would kind of also suggest and say that you know our tenants also see that the pull through and 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 the way that these buildings operate in the aftermath of a either a blackout or a traditional storm. These buildings are thriving. Um, as an example, you know after Ida hit last uh, last year. Um, all of New Orleans was down for seven days, and this building, primarily housing low-income folks, uh, was up and running within 24 hours. Um, and so, and they had that pat. They had some element of power for those seven days. And it was interesting. It was a, it was kind of an experiment to see, you know, as we continue to work with them and train them every day to say, "Hey, guys, we're running low. Conserve your energy." You know, it was it was interesting to kind of see how every day they got a little bit better. We were able to go a little bit longer. We didn't get and we aren't at net zero today. It is a work in progress and we're still working towards it. Um, obviously, we were early on when there were less tenants. But but I think this is a learning experiment and a tool that that can be used for for, you know, affordable housing developers or traditional for profit developers in the future. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you so much um, to all three of our presenters. Um, those are fantastic presentations. I um, already got a preview of this and still I learned from your presentations today. So um, very packed with information. Uh, we're now going to open it up for your questions from the audience and I have a group discussion with our panelists. So if you haven't already, please go to slido.com and continue to enter your questions there and also upvote the questions that you think are the most compelling. So um, I'm going to start with the, the top question, and there's a, several other questions that relate to it. So how are you addressing the split incentive for energy efficiency improvements in multifamily? And just uh, this also, there's another question that says, how can renting tenants in a condo setting incentivize a landlord to incorporate more energy efficiency appliances? I don't want to take that. <laughs> Josh, can you re repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. Uh, the question is about addressing the split incentive for energy efficiency improvements in multifamily. Um, I, I guess what I'm I, what I'm inferring with within that question is, you know, obviously there's incentives. There's incentives for us to develop. There's also incentives for uh, for us at times to pass those those uh, direct savings on. I think it really just depends on what your position is here. So in our case, you know, we were we found ways to subsidize much of the upgrades that were essential for for the the multifamily building. Um, in other cases, as perhaps for a for profit, that's that's simply taking advantage of the twenty percent, twenty six percent solar tax credit, and then maybe perhaps underwriting the the um, savings directly into kind of that rental income. They they needed. They need to take more advantage of of obviously the savings in 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 order to achieve that. So I think it's just a balance and it's just a perspective on where you're coming from. Yeah, and I'd say that at least in our in the market that I our markets that I work in um, in the for profit sector, one of the things that our clients are always looking at is a way to differentiate their product in the marketplace amongst others um, and efficiency and getting to net zero energy. Um, in, in our urban areas, it's definitely one of those ways that they can lend leverage from the marketing side. Um, and they've used that ability on the marketing side. And because it's seen as really beneficial within the marketplace, they've been able to get higher uh, lease terms, uh, rent rentals on those units. And that's a way for them to help offset the cost of that original investment um, of the efficiency measures. Yeah, I saw a study recently that um, indicated that for in the rental market, so with you know market the, the, with market rentals market rate there's potentially a three percent um, cost premium that that just being an identified as like green or like um, energy efficiency can 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 bring from renters from leasing. Paul, do you want to add? Uh, no, I don't have anything to add to this question, but I think uh, it, it's definitely a good question. I think we continue to strive on how to reduce the cost of a lot of these energy efficiency strategies, you know, and we have seen in some sectors like K-12 schools, uh, you know, certainly approaching cost 
a neutrality in moving to these levels of efficiency. So I think that that's part of the holistic design. And certainly as more and more people adopt these and get accustomed to it, that drives down the costs. And so I think the incremental cost gets less every day. Really good point. Yeah. Um, so another question here I thought was really interesting. How important are passive cooling, passive heating, and passive lighting in achieving net zero in multifamily buildings? How much do these contribute to energy savings and energy efficiency? Um, I'll chime in, and I know Paul um, can also chime in, but we did, uh, NREL did extensive modeling for us, um, and we were, the targets in the guide um, were really built on the idea that multifamily buildings, you know, can operate their best when they have an you know, operable window and passive strategies. Um, so often multifamily buildings have the challenge that, um, to, you know, in really efficient compact layouts, a lot of units only have a single side exposure. Um, and so we don't get the, the benefits of cross vent um, going across the building that we might see in an office building. But it doesn't mean that we can't take advantage of natural ventilation and the ability to do high low windows uh, can still give us the ability to um, help, you know, uh, ventilate a space. Having um, articulation on the facade you know, bump outs, bump ins can give us the ability to sort of capture some uh, site breezes. Um, and what we've also found is that, that those passive strategies, good shading, operable windows can actually increase our passive survivability as well. So in the event that of large power outages, um, you know, multifamily buildings tend to be internally load dominated. Um, so there's all that plug load equipment, especially in studio apartments where you still have all the same stuff. It's just a much more compact space. There's a lot of uh, load in, in, in those spaces uh, that can keep them warm um, and, often, and perhaps too warm. And so being able to open up the building and allow um, a heat to escape is, is really important. Um, so we definitely took a dive. I think all of the assumptions in our modeling definitely took advantage of, of passive strategies first um, because they, they mean a lot. Um, and again, during a power outage, those high performance facades can give you a lot more leverage uh, to shelter in place. It also gives you the benefit, you know, Keith talked about the battery system that they had, you know, it allows you to, if, if that's part of the commitment, allows you to kind of downsize that with a lot of these passive strategies. And again, from a dollar point of view, my guess is that the operable windows and, you know, lighting and, and putting the daylighting into that space is, is less money than the batteries yeah. in a lot of cases and reserve the batteries for what you really need them for and the costs associated with that. One of the interesting things when we were looking at sort of sensitivity to daylighting, it was really impacted by, you know, the typical schedule of occupancy for multifamily buildings. And, and note that a lot of the modeling that we were doing predated COVID or was right as we were sort of going into COVID days where the anticipated occupancy in a multifamily building wasn't that high during the day. And so we weren't seeing like this huge drive down in energy use um, from daylighting. Um, even though the floor plate for a typical multifamily project is ideal for it, you know, you have relatively shallow, you know, floor plates relative to the window, the units purposefully don't aren't too deep because you're always, you know, that's an amenity getting access to daylight and it's sort of expected in multifamily buildings. So daylighting is incredibly important, but we weren't seeing the energy benefits. Now that, you know, there's hybrid work and people are working from home, um, we may actually see more benefits from that daylighting where people can avoid turning on electric lights, even when they're working from home. Um, so that'd be um, really interesting future work. I think the other other piece that kind of, you know, one of the things that I hear about the natural ventilation part is that, oh, my climate is really, and then whatever miserable part of your climate that you live in, right? Hot, humid, whatever it is, I see Keith smiling over there. But, you know, in reality, you know, looking at some place like New Orleans, yeah, it might be hot and humid in the summer, but there's a significant time of the year where it's very pleasant. You know, and taking advantage of that climate when that climate is nice is really important. And, and I almost see that as an amenity where people want, you know, some of that fresh air and the breezes and that, that sense of connection, you know, especially, you know, in some of these denser environments. That's, that's great. So uh, I want to move to this next question and, and editorialize myself. Um, could states or utilities use the report to help them design performance-based incentive programs? Does DOE have support for this? And my addition to that is, um, given what Stet mentioned about how with multifamily buildings, often you have limited out, like outside um, access, um, do you support moving to more single-stair buildings? 
I feel like that's the third rail of, <laughs> of safety egress code. So I don't know that I want to touch that too aggressively. Um, I will say, and I, I put it in response in the in the chat, that we are actually seeing more jurisdictions um, offer very substantial incentive programs for um, net zero energy buildings. In our in the areas that I work in, they're actually using the planning code for that um, and providing density bonuses uh, for built for multifamily buildings designed to net zero energy. And that can that is definitely something that can support taller and bigger. Um, whether it supports um, changing egress um, requirements, I, I don't want to dive into that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, you know anything that you can do on creating these programs is important. Now whether DOE or HUD, you know, has direct support for that. You know, we definitely have done work in the past um, in some of the sectors around, you know, how to do incentives. You know, we, we provide the kind of the EUI targets, right? So, you know, right off the bat, you could design an incentive around, show us that the building's going to operate at under 25,000 BTUs a square foot. And um, if you look on some of NREL's publications, it doesn't directly apply to this field, but look up performance-based procurement. Um, there is definitely discussions around commercial real estate and how to get those buildings to performance levels. Um, and not so much from an incentive point of view, but more for how does an owner incentivize a design team and contractors to meet those kinds of targets, which obviously could then you know, kind of scale up to utilities and states. Great. Um, so I have a question here. Um, with, with respect to the SBP project, what are or is the O&M experience in maintaining the PV and battery systems? It's a, it's a great question. And one that I, what I would say is so far, it, it really hasn't been significant. The, the one variable that I think is worth noting is, is it's actually a very interesting design that we have here. But the 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 battery the uh, the battery kind of uh, in partnership uh, again with the kind of the what I'll call kind of uh, uh, brains of the system it's learning from it's learning the habits so we actually we've implemented a kind of a peak shaving element to it and so we continue to kind of look through the data to to figure out ways that you know how much do you want to, how much do you want to shave off and use the battery during kind of the, the middle of the summers, but then, but then what, what risk is that putting you at, you know, should there be a blackout or should there be an event coming, you know, in terms of just the day-to-day -day maintenance, very little. Um, we actually, I mean, we have an, uh, an annual service contract, but they come out once or twice a year just to make sure everything's functioning. Um, but really it's how much you want to put into kind of optimize uh, the programming and and really kind of learn from the usage. That's great. Um, uh, so I think we're that that's just uh, I, I'll I'll do one more question. Um, um, what what sources existing or needed would be useful in modeling, benchmarking, tracking progress on multifamily building efficiency and climate goals? Um, well, I'd say the guide, so in the guide, we have quite a bit of, in the appendix on energy modeling, we have a quite a, quite a bit of information on inputs that went into our modeling, a lot of assumptions around schedules, efficiency of equipment across the board for different climate zones. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about um, too much, but it's definitely talked about in the guide, um, is that when looking at O&M and sort of ongoing efficiency, you know, one of the challenges in multifamily buildings is getting tenant engagement. You know, there's this idea, there's something happening over here, it's an efficiency measure, how do I get tenants excited about it? And so we talked a little bit about some of the strategies that can be deployed, and these are coming from our client, you know, for clients and developers of doing um, competition-based um, uh, incentives of tracking energy use, uh, because, you know, through submetering, um, and, and providing something that's actually useful. So for, for buildings that have say common laundry, providing laundry tokens or laundry um, uh, uh, expense 
um, offsets for you know tenants that hit the highest energy mark um, and finding some way to incentivize it either through acknowledgement or through a direct uh, incentive are ways to get tenants um, sort of engaged in that process but a huge component of it is the outreach the education um, and ongoing maintenance because of that sort of education one of the things that we find is that because tenant turnover um, is you know that's a real thing in multifamily buildings and that it's not just a one-time blitz of tech telling everybody about, about the building and disappearing it has to be an ongoing maintenance uh, because new tenants come in and they're unaware of some of the strategies you're deploying and they might put in you know an extra refrigerator out on the balcony you know in the middle of the summer and that's going to just you know all of a sudden they're the highest energy user in the entire complex and and that ongoing maintenance and education is incredibly important so uh, we're gonna have to leave it there i think um but so thank you again to all of our panelists. This has been an incredible, um, informative session. Um, thank you um, to everyone for your questions. Um, this webinar is part uh, of the 2022-2023 Better Buildings webinar series. Uh, just visit the Better Building Solutions Center to learn more and register. Um, we hope you will join us for our next webinar on September 27th titled, Show Me the Money, Financing Decarbonization Projects when you can learn about the financing tools Better Buildings financial allies use with organizations interested in decarbonization projects, along with practical steps to identify and source capital from grants, third-party investors, bonds, and more. If you're interested in learning more about the topics discussed today, I encourage you to download our additional resources handout from the Zoom chat box. The handout contains links to resources from Better Buildings and our speakers. You will receive an email notice when today's recording slides and transcript are available on the Better Building Solutions Center. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank our panelists again, Paul, Stett, and Keith for taking the time to be with us today. If you'd like to learn more about the resources discussed today, please check out the Better Building Solutions Center or contact our presenters directly with additional questions, or if we couldn't get to your question during the Q&A period, you can also follow the Better Buildings Initiative on LinkedIn and Twitter for all the latest news. Thank you, everyone.